All right. So today we are talking all about generic training plans and the problem with generic training plans and some of the mistakes that runners often make when they decide, okay, I'm going to train for something. I'm going to train for a race. I need to find a plan. And so they download a generic plan from the internet. They go to coach Google and ask coach Google what kind of plan they need, or maybe they find a plan in a book or people still buying training books with the old school training plans in the back. In a book, in a magazine yep. built into their watch there's training yep. plans in all sorts of places oh that's true yeah there's lots of apps and watch it like now that people follow maybe your magic treadmill has a training plan built into yep. it i'm sure they yep. do yeah exactly so there's a lot of places that you can go to get these training plans nowadays and so today we want to talk about some of the mistakes that runners make when following these generic plans and how you can avoid those mistakes because we want you to be successful in your training. The The point of this episode is not to tell you that like generic plans are bad and you know, you, you need to go hire a coach. That's not the point of this episode. The point is it's to help you guys understand some of the common mistakes that people make when they are following some of these generic plans so that you can adjust, you can figure out how to fig how to make some of these plans work for you in a better way. Because what we want you to understand by the end of this episode is that generic plans are generic, okay? Yeah. And personalized plans are better. Okay, that is the very simple thing. Like that is what I wrote on the outline today. Generic plans are generic and personalized plans are better because that's just the truth of the matter, all right? So does that mean that you have to go out and spend $200 a month on a coach? No, it doesn't. We're gonna talk about things that you can do when with those generic plans to help personalize them and make them work better for you. Yeah, the takeaway here, I mean, it, there's got two points to it. Generic plans are generic. That's the opening. The takeaway is not generic plans are necessarily bad. Right. They're just generic. Right. So, so that can lead that, to problems. Right. Because right. they they try to paint with as broad of a brush, a brush as possible mm -hmm. or, or not. They try and go remarkably specific and maybe you luck out and that plan falls for you. But mm -hmm. most of the time, either it's not narrow enough for you because it tries to cover every single athlete or it's so narrow and it it doesn't cover you as an athlete. Right, exactly. So let's jump into some of the common mistakes that we see people making when it comes to running plans. All right, so we have 75 of these. <laughs> We do not. But before we jump in, I do want to remind you guys, if you don't follow us on Instagram yet, head over to at Real Life Runners on Instagram and shoot me a DM and say hi, because I love connecting with our podcast listeners over there. Excellent. We actually have three of these, three big common mistakes that people make with, with three, that. Three big common mistakes. And then, you know, what you guys can do to help avoid some of these mistakes. So mistake number one that we often see and this actually has two parts, okay? Because so part one is that someone decides, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna train for a race, sure. so I need to go find a plan, right? So you go Got to it. Coach Google and you Google and say half marathon training plans, and sometimes people get even more specific because they have a, a specific goal that they're going for. So they're like sub two hour half marathon training plans, right? Yep. You try to go a little bit more specific to try to find a quote unquote better plan or a plan that's going to be more likely to help you achieve your goal. I mean, if you start Googling half marathon training plan, it's probably going to fill in mm -hmm. half marathon training plan to break two hours. Mm -hmm. Like that's going to be one of the options yeah. it puts up because that's a big goal for a lot of people. It is. Yeah. And, and there's, like you said, also, may, maybe you're not going to coach Google. Maybe you're going to coach Peloton or coach Garmin. Coach Garmin's a big thing now. Yeah. There's a, like, that's actually the name of the program inside the Garmin Connect app. There is Coach Garmin or and, Garmin Coach. And there's there's plenty of plans mm -hmm. put probably in there by, you know, legitimate coaches who've written books and, and are coaching right. other people, but they had to take all of their, their coaching knowledge and put it into a plan mm -hmm. or maybe like two options of a plan. Right. And that's going to be a little generic. Yeah. And when you're creating training plans, because we obviously have created hundreds of training plans Lots at this them. point in time, right? There are common themes, right? So there are definitely principles. There are guiding principles. There are best practices that you can use, but 
a lot of those best practices don't account for individual athlete differences. And this kind of leads to our first mistake, which is you download or you find a training plan and you follow it exactly as it's written. And what happens here is that a lot of times when people find the training plan and they follow it exactly, and then they end up not getting the results they want, then they end up blaming themselves right? They, they take on like an extra, a large amount of disappointment and they're like, I don't understand it. I followed the plan exactly as it was written and I didn't break two hours or I didn't hit my goal or I didn't get X, Y, or Z. The problem must be me, right? They, they internalize that. Obviously because the, the plan could never be wrong. They found it on the internet where everything is absolutely perfect, right? Mm -hmm. So here's the issue is as long as you, you have faith in the plan and wherever you get a plan from, I feel like it is important that you have some faith in that plan. Absolutely. But following it to an absolute T and then saying, okay, well, I did all of the steps along the way, so I have to get the outcome. So you just, the plan can guarantee things and plans cannot guarantee all the conditions that can show up on a race, all the things that could have shown up during training. The plans are designed to, in general, try and get a lot of people towards a positive result. Right. And it probably did, did get you to a positive result, just might not have gotten you exactly exactly where you want it. Right. So a lot of times what happens, so what, what, what you need to understand when it comes to these generic training plans is that all of these plans assume the same starting point for every athlete that follows the plan, right? So if you sign up for a plan or you download a plan or you put that plan into your app, it assumes you're able to run three miles. It assumes that you're able to do a 20 minute tempo run. It assumes that you're able to start with the six mile long run or whatever that starting week is, or those first couple of weeks or that first month, it assumes that your body is able to handle and tolerate that load. It also assumes that the adaptations for every athlete will be the same. Yes, which they're, they're definitely not. And then, then a third point off of this, it assumes that every athlete, not just that the adaptations will be the same, but the rate at which the athletes are adapting is going to be the same. That every athlete would take this workout and then make a, a sing, the same incremental improvement mm -hmm. and that leads to the next workout and then the same incremental mental improvement. Growth is not linear and growth from one athlete to the next definitely does not follow the same path, but that's how you have to kind of design a generic plan mm -hmm. is it assumes, okay, if the athlete does like these couple of weeks, that'll kind of set them up for week three and four. They do those ones that'll set them up for this one. It assumes sort of this kind of just general progression. Linear progression. It's, uh, sometimes linear. I, I would argue that there's probably some generic plans out there that don't think that it's linear, mm -hmm. but they still assume that every athlete following the plan is going to be able to progress in a similar fashion, which is just not the same. Athletes are making totally different adaptations and because they're adapting differently, oh. they're going to adapt at totally different rates. Right. And so I think that that's, you know, one of the issues is that when you follow that plan exactly as it's written, sometimes people never tend to question it and see like, is this actually the best plan for me? You just kind of look at it and you're like, okay, well, here's the training plan that I'm going to follow. So I'm going to go for it. And like you said, I think that there is an important aspect of actually having faith in that plan yep. and dedicating yourself to that plan. And that's a big plus, right? Because there's a we'll lot cover of people- that mistake in a, a little bit here. Right, because that's mistake number two, but well, actually number three. three. But I think that, you know, understanding that the, the big one here is assuming that every athlete's going to kind of grow and progress at the same way, at the same rate. And, and when that doesn't happen, there's a lot of disappointment that can often go along with that. Right. This is the idea that a computer could create the perfect training plan for you. Mm -hmm. Because in this, in this world of get a plan, follow the plan exactly, get the result, that suggests that training is purely a math equation. Mm -hmm. These workouts will drop your 5k time by 30 seconds. Yeah. This workout will take off, you know, 10 seconds per mile for your entire marathon. Like, because that's the workout that, that changes this exact system in your body. And right. it doesn't, that's not how people actually adapt to all of these different things. Right. Well, and it also doesn't take into account all of the other things that you've got going in your life, right. That yes. also affect the way that your body feels that also affect the way that you're able to train. 
So if this plan has you running five or six days a week, but the, in order to get all of those runs in, that means that you're going to be have you're going to have to either wake up really early in the morning or train late at night, and you're not getting as much sleep, and maybe you have extra stress at work. All of those things factor into your ultimate outcome, right? So if you are if you follow the plan exactly as it's written, that can be great. It can also be not so great because in that process, you could be sacrificing sleep and other recovery in order to try to follow that training plan exactly as it's written. Because a lot of the training plans don't also include how much sleep you should be getting, how much rest or recovery. They just they might have rest day on the sure. on the schedule, but they don't actually explain what that means. And a lot of times athletes see rest day and say, oh, well, that just means I'm not running that day. I can still do this or I can still do that. And they're not taking a rest day as an actual rest day. So then you show up at the race and you're actually undertrained or you're overtrained and you just don't get the re results that you want. Right. Or maybe you are in fact taking a rest day, but you're forgetting the recovery that follows the workout mm -hmm. on the day of. Yeah. It's like, oh, well, Tuesday has a speed day. So I'm going to make sure I get my speed workout in there, but then not taking into account the nutrition and hydration and physical recovery that, that you need to follow that. Hey, even if you have two twins that are following the same exact plan, my every time I write a, a science test, I like to use Timmy and Tommy as my my examples. Maybe they're following the exact same plan, but one of them has issues with nutrition. They've got body issues and they don't fuel properly. Mm -hmm. They're trying to do the same thing, but one of them is putting all sorts of additional physical stress on it. Right. Maybe they actually they're both fueling fine, they're doing great, but one of them has you know, three young children and the other is still single. That's a total different stress situation. Yeah. So there's a whole lot of other stresses. Training is not math. There's a whole lot of other things going on. Right. So you just have to understand that just because you follow the same training plan as someone else, that does not mean that you are going to get the same results because you are an individual and your body is going to adapt differently than everyone else on the planet. Okay. Which takes us to mistake number two. Okay. So again, you find a training plan and you are going to follow it exactly. We're still sticking with that, but you don't have the proper foundation. That's trouble. Right? And so this is going back to that idea that all generic training plans assume the same starting point. They assume that you're able to take on that training load where the plan starts. And there's so many times that this is so not the case, right? And what happens if you jump into a plan without the proper foundation is that you end up injured or burnt out. You just end up overtrained and just tired all the time. You end up with these aches and pains that pop up. You end up with an actual injury that you have to go see a physical therapist or a doctor for. You end up with an injury, but you're just like, well, I'm just going to ignore it, right? Because I'm training for a half marathon. So I'm just going to get through it. And the problem, well, I shouldn't say the problem. I mean, we, we see the problem there, yeah, right? That, that the it, there, is the, there is the problem, right? So going back to this idea of assuming the same starting point, if you look around at every runner, like go, go to a race, right? Go to a half <laughs> marathon, go to a marathon, go to a 5K. I love the local 5Ks because local you, 5Ks you, you look great. around at a local 5K, you can see every shape, size, gender, culture, like all sorts of things, right? So looking around you on the starting line, does anyone else look exactly like you? No, like they don't. Like you are an individual, right? So your plan, your body is going to adapt to that plan differently. You have individual strengths and weaknesses. So if you're following a generic plan that's in an app on your phone or that you download from the internet and you're crossing off days on a paper calendar, what are you doing to target those strengths and weaknesses or enhance those strengths, I should say, right? Sure. To target the weaknesses, to address some of those weaknesses or to enhance your strengths. Because if you're doing the same plan, like if Kevin and I followed the same plan, which we would never do because we have very different strengths and weaknesses. This is a very good example. If you and I followed the same plan. Even if we followed the same exact plan, we would get very, very different results because we had our are at a very different starting point from each other. Well, also, whose who's plan are we following? Like, mm -hmm. are we both going to follow a plan that works best for you? And does that mean that I follow your paces? Because mm -hmm. this is the other thing that sometimes comes with these plans is you type in your current PR and it tells you your pace. Yep. So 
you know, that's great if it's actually predicting well, or if you're honest with that. But if you're giving it a 5k and it's trying to then figure out all of your workouts for a marathon, yeah. that's not necessarily saying that you have the same foundation of someone who's already run a, a you know, quote unquote, comparable marathon time mm-hmm. to that, that 5k, right? Like, the the proper foundation differs so much from one person to the next. You could also have somebody who has such a massive foundation that the plan leaves them drastically undertrained. Correct. Like if I tried to follow a training plan that would be much more appropriate for you, I'm missing out on running days and I'm not at all tapping into running potential mm-hmm. because I'm I'm leaving so much on the table mm-hmm. just because I'm I'm used to so much higher mileage than you are. Right, exactly. But I mean, that wouldn't necessarily fall into this category of like without the proper foundation. That it's just, almost with too much foundation. Yeah, that's true. Well, that that's kind of falls into like mistake number one is like where you kind of end up undertrained mm-hmm. a lot of times. But the other thing you want to take into account too is that these generic plans don't also take into account your personal history, right? Like what does your history look like? Have you had previous injuries? I, you know, used to play basketball when I was in high school and I tore some ligaments in my right ankle playing basketball. So that right ankle tends to be a little bit weaker than the other side. And the weakness in my right ankle can put basically... Have you ever noticed, I don't know if you're this person or people Mm -hmm. that you know are this person, but if you've ever noticed most people, and I've worked as a physical therapist for 15 plus years now. So most people tend to have one side where a lot of their problems, their pain, their injuries tend to occur. And a lot of times that's a result of some injury that happened a long time ago, like decades (laughs) in the past, right? That that caused some sort of weakness or instability that was never really addressed that then has led to a whole host of problems down the road that they never really realized were related to that initial injury. Right. So then you're dealing with previous injuries, which you're not even acknowledging them. You're right. like, oh yeah, I'm, I've been running a bunch. I have plenty of foundation, but you And that happened 30 years ago. Yeah. So clearly this is no longer affecting right. me. The problem is, is what if your plan includes no strength training? And because of this injury, now, as you start ramping up mileage, you've got this weird imbalance in your body because mm-hmm. there's tightness on one side that isn't on the other mm-hmm. from injury that was never fully dealt with because you were a kid and you recovered well enough right. to still function as a kid. Mm-hmm. Well, especially those of us that are in our 40s, 50s, and 60s. like It wasn't like, oh, you hurt yourself. Let's go see the doctor and go see the physical therapist three times a week. Like That wasn't a a thing. thing. It was like, when the swelling goes down, then you go back to playing sports. (laughs) You know, throw some ice on it. The The swelling goes down. Can you walk normally again? Cool. Can you run normally again? Great. Now go back and play your sports. Maybe wrap an ace bandage around (laughs) it for a day. Right. And then you're good. Right. But it wasn't like the, the focus on rehab wasn't there. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, like it is today. Well, I mean, 30 years ago, I don't think every eight-year-old playing like soccer where they just all just chase after the ball was going to automatically be in the World Cup. So they had to be on like three different club teams. I know. Don't get me started on kids (laughs) sports today. But so here's the thing, right? So, okay, maybe you recognize you've been listening to our podcast for a little bit. You understand that runners need to incorporate strength training. Great. So you go to YouTube and you you search for strength exercises for runners. Do you even know which ones to do? Oh my word. Do you even know which circuits to follow? Do you even know if those are what are going to actually benefit you? There is so much out there. And some of the information is straight crap. I will tell you that right now. Okay. Some of the, the circuits and the information out there are amazing. Some of them are absolutely fantastic, right? So I'm definitely not downplaying that you can find amazing content for free on the internet. The question is, is that the best workout for you to be doing right now with where you are, with your goals, with your experience, with your individual strengths and weaknesses that are actually going to move you closer to your goal that so that you're not just wasting your time, right? Like if you just start doing, people are like, oh, I know I need to strengthen my core. So I'm just going to do some crunches and some sit-ups. Perfect. Eh, like, 
but that's what I did in PE class in the 1980s. Right. Oh, okay. Just throw in some push-ups, right? Like, eh, right. Like, so there are specific exercises that we as runners should be prioritizing in general. And, and there are some generalizations that, that I do like to make because I do believe that all runners can benefit from calf strengthening. All runners can benefit from single leg exercises. All runners can benefit from planks and side planks. Okay. Like there are just certain exercises that are very good for all runners in general. But then there are other exercises, again, based on your specific individual strengths and weaknesses, that would greatly benefit you to include in your plan and in your weekly routine. But part of this, I mean, and this is why it goes under the make sure you're following a plan with proper foundation yeah. is two different people with very different strength training histories mm -hmm. would have different benefits from different workouts. Yes. There's one person who has experience in the gym and you say, Hey, I need you to go do squats and mm -hmm. lunges. And they're like, Oh, sure. And they can put a bar over their back and do a proper back squat mm -hmm. without hurting themselves. Right. You because they that, have experience. You say that to somebody else, they go into the gym and they break themselves. Mm -hmm. Like that is, they need to be doing body weight exercises, mm -hmm. maybe advance to some bands. There's ways to, to adjust all of these things mm -hmm. so that they're not suddenly throwing this huge load. Oh, but I checked the internet and they said for training for certain things, I should, as a, as a distance runner, if I have enough time before my race, I really want high weights. Not if you Runners should lift heavy. Yes. Which is true. Totally true. But not if you can't actually perform the move functionally. Mm -hmm. Like if you're doing the movement inappropriately and then throwing a huge load on top of it, you're just setting yourself up to be broken. Yeah. And I, I saw a great video from a physical therapist. I think he was a physical therapist the other day on social media again. And he was talking about, like he was critiquing, I don't want to say criticizing, critiquing, critiquing another video that apparently a bunch of people have sent him to critique. Sure. Like, and, and like, what's your opinion on this? Right. And the whole idea was so much of what we do as fitness professionals and as physical therapists and coaches is modulate the load that is placed on the athlete, mm -hmm. right? Because it's true. If you run more, in most cases, that will benefit you. If you lift heavier weights, in most cases, that will benefit you. But if your body is not ready to accept the mileage, if your body's not ready to accept the strength load, that can lead to injury and pain and dysfunction, mm -hmm. right? So it's about giving you the load that you're able to accept right now and then a little bit more, a little bit more, yep. right? Because by giving you a little bit more, your body makes the adaptations and rises to the occasion, mm -hmm. right? Like, But if you give it a lot more, that's just a weight that's too big or a load that's too big for your body to handle. Right. So when you talk proper foundation, this is a lot more than just how many miles you're currently running per week. Yeah. Like there's a whole history of foundation. You, you went back all the way to possible injury in childhood, your most recent history with strength training. There's all sorts mm -hmm. of options here. So say you have three athletes here and you're like, all right, let's get a half marathon training for, plan for them. Yep. And you got one person who, you know, two, three times a week and every weekend is out there. They're maybe they're basketball player. They're, they're doing like volleyball, but they're like in their thirties, forties, but they're, they're doing ball sports all the time. Mm -hmm. You got a post collegiate runner. They ran through high school and college. And now they're looking to do something on their own. And you've got a brand new runner who's looking to lose weight. But all of them also run about 20 miles per week. Yeah. Okay. Those are very different foundations. Mm -hmm. What do you do with them? You're like, oh, well, no, they're all running 30 miles per week. So we can put this on this plan because it starts at 20 miles per week and right. it builds up from there. But one of them has fast twitch muscles. One of them had all of the base built from college running. And one of them is just getting into it. Those are very, very different foundations. Absolutely. Like I, I also like to think of it in, in cooking. Like if I were to make an omelet. Mm -hmm. My omelet is not going to be as good as like Gordon Ramsay's omelet or Giada's omelet. They are professional chefs. Mm -hmm. An omelet is a pretty basic thing to make, <laughs> right? Like I can make a pretty good omelet. I can, we can both follow the same exact recipe, sure. right? Like Giada De Laurentiis, she's going to give me, well, let's, let's pick an Italian. She's going to, she's going to give me her recipe for lasagna, okay. right? My lasagna, even if I follow her recipe exactly as written, is going to taste different than her lasagna. Yeah, let's just make your lasagna. It's delicious. <laughs> I 
<laughs> we, just, we don't need you out as right. recipe. Or going back to the mm-hmm. omelets, right? Isn't like Gordon Ramsay, that's like one of the, isn't that one of the first things that he used he to like make all, people? He makes them all scrambled eggs and he, scrambled eggs. he likes kind yeah. of a slightly runny scrambled eggs and, mm-hmm. and people overcook it. And then he gets to curse because that's right. what he likes to do. But, but it's something that simple. Like I know that it, cause we used to love watching the cooking shows. Like when, I just when like when when curses at people <laughs> and even top chef though, too. Like yep. I remember they did like an omelet challenge, right? Just, and those, all of them are professional chefs. Like yep. on that show, there's like what, 20 chefs that start the show. Amazing chefs. And like five of them come in and they're eating. And they're like, this is dry and terrible. This is disgusting, right? Did you consider salt? <laughs> right. Like yes, I did. I, I, I'm a professional chef. Because all of them have different backgrounds, right? Maybe one of them works in a diner and yep. cooks omelets all day long, right? One of them works in a five-star or three-star Michelin chef restaurant, and yep. but it focuses on raw food, great, you know, or they haven't cooked an egg in forever, Japanese food or whatever it is, right? So they have different skill sets, different experiences, and all of their food is going to taste differently. So it's the same thing when it comes to our, our running. I know it's kind of a random metaphor, but same idea, right? The foundation, the experiences, the history, all of it's different. So just because you're following the same plan as your friend does not mean that you're going to get the same results. It doesn't mean that that plan's even the right thing for each of you to be doing. Yeah. I mean, that was kind of my point is because of how different those foundations are, yeah. they should not even be on the same plane, even though it looks like they're essentially the same runner. Mm-hmm. If you just look at running history, oh, for the last three weeks, they've all been running 20 miles per week. Mm-hmm. Great. Put them on the same plan. But they have such different histories. Right. It's not even close. Well, and that's what a lot of these generic plans assume, right? So there's the generic plan that just is like, here's your half marathon plan. It doesn't even give you any sort of context. And then there are the more specific types of plans that are like, okay, this is a beginner plan. So this is for your first half marathon, or this is an intermediate plan. I love the intermediates, right? The intermediate plan, like you, you're able to run 20 miles per week currently and a long run of six miles on the weekend. You're like, oh, sweet. That's me. I can do that. Right. But there's so many unanswered questions there. Like, have you ever done speed work before? Are you currently dealing with plantar fasciitis? Correct, right? There's so many other things that that generic training plan doesn't ask you to qualify you, to even let you know whether or not that is the right plan for you to be doing right now. No, it already makes you put a qualifier on your running before you even pick a plan. Yeah. Ooh, am I a beginner runner or am I an intermediate runner? Yeah. Am I even, would I dare to call myself an advanced runner? Mm-hmm. Like it makes you choose one of the three options. Yeah. Well, let me see. We're going to talk about this part down here. Yeah. A little bit later. Yeah. Cause like there was something that I was just thinking about that I wasn't sure if I should include right now, because this is like one of the big things that the, one of the big mistakes that, that really gets me is that people sign up for a race. And I'm going to talk about this more in more detail in a little bit here. They sign up for the race first yeah, and then they go back mm-hmm. and like, okay, I better find that plan. No, now. we did. We right? dig into that one a little bit later. Yeah. We definitely need to, to dig into that one. All right. Common mistake number three that we see a lot of runners making is that they find the plan. Got it. And then they partially follow it. Of course they do. Right? So they find that plan and they're like, oh, okay, great. This is my half marathon plan. Oh, well, this says I have to run five days a week, but I only run four days a week. So I'm just going to get rid of one of these runs. Yes. Which one should I get rid of? Right. Uh, the, the, great question. That's a great question. And it's usually answered with the one that seems the most intimidating. Mm-hmm. That's the problem is it very often, right. if you try and slightly adjust, if you pick and choose from the plan and try and make it work a little bit for you without a whole lot of guidance behind it, without a whole lot of thought, people end up doing the parts that look similar to what they're currently doing. Right. And so when people find these plans and partially follow them and remove random pieces kind of at will, what happens is, again, they don't get the results that they want. And that leads to a lot of disappointment that leads to frustration. And again, a lot of times it's this feeling that the problem is me. Mm -hmm. Clearly this plan worked for my friend. This plan worked for someone else. Why isn't it working for me? Oh, it must be me. It must be because I'm not a very good runner. It must be because I'm just a slow runner. This must be where my potential is capped. Right. right. And they they start to take on 
all of the the blame and the guilt and the shame of not getting those results because clearly this plan was in runner's world it must work it, it was it's good enough to be in runner's world it, it's good enough to be in garmin it's good enough to be xyz mm -hmm. so the problem must be me right but if you're not actually following all of the plan it you know, we already covered the issues of following the whole plan exactly to a T, but if you're only picking and choosing part of the plan, yeah. you're likely, it's it's possible that you're hitting the hard parts, but then it's also possible that you're hitting only the hard parts, which causes its own issue. Mm -hmm. Most likely, That's people, true. if they're skipping parts, are going to skip the parts that seem new and weird and intimidating and uncomfortable, but that's where growth happens. Mm -hmm. So if you follow just the part that looks most like what you've already been doing, you essentially create this false ceiling because you're refusing to do the parts that would allow you to actually grow. Yeah. So it, there's a kind of two types of runners that I see a lot. There's a lot of different types of runners, obviously. And we typically on the podcast don't even encourage you to put yourself into a, a certain runner basket. We just say you're a runner, we right? We just encourage you to put yourself in running shoes. Yeah, we, we running <laughs> shoes and the runner's basket, right? Like just identify, start to identify yourself as a runner. That makes a really big difference. But there are certain people that really like the longer, slower distance types of runs, which sure. is more like you, right? When we go back to Kevin and I and how we are different runners, he tends to like those those slow, long, not, and I shouldn't say slow, but Every, it's slower for you. Everyone heard her call me slow. Yeah. <laughs> everyone heard it. <laughs> yeah. The, the slower pace runs for you, right? Slow is obviously relative because Kevin's slow runs on his 20 miles are like my one mile PR. So that's, you know, a They're different story. Fast. Almost. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> so, but anyway, you're more wired to like the endurance runs. I enjoy it. My body's set up to right. succeed at it too. I'm more wired to enjoy the speed runs. And that's actually how I started liking running in the first place was I hated those longer, slower distance runs because I found them so boring. And granted, I wasn't actually doing them at a slow, easy no, pace. Not. I was doing them at that moderate pace. I was making that mistake for a very long time. But what Kevin taught me how to do that actually made running fun were interval workouts where I could go faster and then slower and then faster and then slower. And that constant change of pace made running so much more fun to me. So I tend to default to those speed workouts, even though they're hard, they're more fun. So I enjoy them more, which means that for a portion of time before, you know, we developed our whole method and coaching and all this, all these things that we now know. I would run a lot of speed work and avoid my easy, slower distance runs. Yes, you would. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. Like, that's the part of running that you like. You like that constant variety. There's plenty yeah. of people who like constant variety. You can have all sorts of different runs right. where there's constant change of pace in all of it that overall the run is still an easy run, that overall the run becomes a moderate effort, that mm -hmm. it's working on your higher end speed. You just change the intensity of the intervals. You change the time of the intervals. You change the recovery. You could change pace and do quote unquote intervals every single day that you go out to run. Right. But my point was that because I like the speed workouts more. You def default and avoid the distance? I de well, not necessarily the distance because I knew I had to do the longer runs, right? Yep. But the easy days, I was like, oh, I'll just make, I'll just do a couple more speed workouts this week. Yes. Right. And that ends up leading to some overtraining. And it also led me to not develop as much of a, a cardio base, mm -hmm. right? Like we always talk about the importance of easy runs and L2 training here on the podcast. I didn't, I wasn't developing that because and, I wasn't doing those types of runs. And since you were pretty much focused on a 5k, you're like, well, I'm, I'm trying to work at this faster thing. So yeah. I really want to make sure that I'm getting good speed. The problem is that a 5k is not actually that short of a distance. No. Like a 5k, I'm going to forget the number on this ex exactly here, but I want to say that a 5k is something like 90% aerobic, maybe 95% aerobic. It's, it's a huge amount. So yes, you need to build up some speed, but the overall amount of of you know the energy systems being used there is just aerobic base right. that you need to create so that you can actually run a fast 5k exactly and so when i understood and then when we, when we got into more of these runs right then I, again i would default to the shorter faster things mm -hmm. versus the tempo types of runs yep. so even when i was like okay fine i'll do the easy runs i'll do the longer runs i'll slow those things down but when it came to the actual speed workouts i was like oh i don't want to do a tempo workout. Right. And so then 
there was a combination of convincing you that sometimes you had to do the tempo yeah. workout. And there was a way that the two of us worked together and was like, okay, we'll try this style of workout because it'll get a similar benefit, yeah. but you'll enjoy it. And mm -hmm. that kind of goes to what we're, we'll get to eventually here. Tempo but repeat. What, what I like to visualize this guy is partially following the plan. I have so many students in my class, bless their souls. I give homework assignments and they do the homework assignments, but they do the questions that they understand. Yeah. And they then they get to a question that they don't get. And instead of like sitting there and trying to figure it out, they just skip it. And they do the next couple of ones that they get. And then they get to another one like, oh, I skipped that. And they just put a question mark. There's no struggle with it. They just put a question mark and move themselves along. Mm -hmm. And then in class, never ask a question. They participate so they make sure they get their good participation score. But they always <laughs> participate by raising their hand on easy questions and giving the, what they know is the correct answer. Yeah. They never actually push themselves outside of the comfort zone. And then it comes time for a test and the results don't go very well mm. because they never tried any of the difficult material. They're very good at the easy material, but they never tried the difficult homework. They never asked the difficult question in class. They never made themselves feel slightly uncomfortable. And so when it comes time for the test, which in running is the race, it just doesn't lead to the results that they were actually aiming for. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that it's a, it's a great metaphor. But one thing that I was also thinking about too, when it comes to partially following the plan, mm -hmm. I think that this this is a, definitely a common thing, right? Where people just kind of pick and choose. Of course. I think the other thing that people that fall into making this mistake as well is that they don't understand the plan, right? They download the plan and the plan says, okay, you know, you should be doing a tempo run today. And they're like, what the heck's a tempo run? They don't yeah. know what that, that is. And so they go to coach Google and they Google tempo run. Good luck trying to figure that out, they, right? Like there are so many different definitions of what a tempo run actually is. There are different coaches that have different definitions. I mean, there's I not one. One two coaching podcasts. One. Yeah. There, there's a husband, wife, and there are two other coaches on this other podcast. Those four people have three different definitions of what a tempo run is. Yeah. And the husband, wife only kind of sort of agree. <laughs> like, right. And I mean, that's four respected coaches mm -hmm. and it's still debatable of what the answer is. Right. So then if you say, okay, well, a tempo run means mm -hmm. that this is a pace that you'll be able to hold for about an hour. But what if you start a plan and you're not able to run for an hour yet? Yep. You have no idea what the heck that means. Okay. Well, it means that it's like at kind of a 10K effort level. Well, I've never run a 10K I've before. I've been running for a month. Right. <laughs> what does that mean? Or I've run 10K, but I've never raced a 10K, right? Yeah. Running a 10K and racing a 10K are two very different things, right? Trying to actually push yourself to a level where you're really trying to to run a 10k as fast as you're able to versus just going out and running a casual 10k sure two different things right mm -hmm. okay well what about training by effort right well we're asking you to go out on at like a level five or six out of ten well, what the heck does that mean you know what does that feel like in my body right so even if you google tempo run or fartlek run or whatever it might be you might still not know what that means, right? So, so you're just kind of making it up as you go along, which means you're not actually following that plan. You're you're probably not getting the same benefits that were intended with you know the coach that actually wrote that plan. Right. And one last thing on this, and because I want to move on to the uh, when we talk kind of about the benefits of personalizing, partially following a plan. Sometimes people will come up with like three different plans, and they like them all. Oh yeah. So they'll pick and choose from various plans. That's true. This is, essentially, plans. this is essentially saying, all right, I'm going to do this puzzle, yep. but I also want to do that puzzle. So we're just going to mix the pieces together. Mm -hmm. Mixing two 500 piece puzzles together does not make a thousand piece puzzle. It just makes a pile of pieces. Right. Like, and also- And you're going to find some pieces that go together, right? Like sure. you'll be able to put some sections together, but overall you're never going to be able to put all thousand pieces into one complete Right. Masterpiece. Like, how come that castle is coming out of the top of the cat's head? I have no idea. So but weird. I threw the picture away because I don't understand the point of the plan in the first place. Yeah. But I like this workout and I like that workout. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to put those in my week. That's often what happens with the multiple plans. Right. Or another thing that, I, that we didn't put down either here is that life gets in the way. Yeah. Right. Like you guys are listening to a podcast called Real Life Runners. Sometimes life gets in the way and you have to modify the plan. You're not able to do the plan exactly as it's written. Maybe you're going on vacation. Maybe your kid gets sick. Maybe you have, you're taking care of an aging parent and they require more 
from you because of something that's going on specifically at that time that was completely unexpected, right? Like there are so many real life scenarios that come up. And if you are trying to strictly follow a plan, it's not going to work out a lot of the times, right? And right. so you end up partially following that plan. You end up missing days and then you're like, okay, well, now what do I do? And so people will try to make up those days or move those days around and try to like make sure that they get in all the things. And it actually leads to overtraining. It can lead to that yeah. burnout and to that injury because they're not adjusting the plan in the best way possible for them, for their body, for what's going on in their life right now, because all of that matters. It matters Whatever's happening in your real life is going to affect your training level and your training is going to affect how you show up in the rest of your life, which takes us to our last point here, which is a personalized plan is the most effective and enjoyable way for you to achieve your goals. Okay. Personalized plans are better than generic plans. They just are yep. right. And so you have to understand, okay. Can I use a generic plan? Can I can I take that and personalize it to work for me? Yes. Because a lot of generic plans, they have a basis, right? They're they're created by someone that knows what they're doing, most likely. Or right? at, at this point, they might be created by AI. Who knows? Who knows, right? But most likely they're they're created with some sort of structure using some principles using some sort of coaching philosophy right and right? There's, there's several they're rooted in something good there are several good intelligent coaching philosophies yes. and whoever put the plan together probably is following one of them maybe they blended a couple of them to their own coaching philosophy mm -hmm. but there's some reasoning to it it's just a matter of how does that thing then become personalized and effective for you mm -hmm. making sure that, that plan fits to you so right. we've covered some some mistakes that show up here you know whether you're strictly following the plan following the plan without the right foundation, following bits and pieces of the plan. One of the big issues, even with a personalized plan, is failure to adjust along the way. Yeah. Not properly acknowledging your starting point. That's the second one of making sure that you have the appropriate foundation for the plan. And one of Angie's favorites, giving yourself far, far too strict of a timeline yeah. for your plan, which I think is what you wanted to talk about. Yeah, that's what I wanted to talk about earlier when people decide, okay, well, I'm going to choose my goal and I'm going to set a date for that goal. Mm -hmm. And then I'm just going to figure out how I'm going to make that happen. Yeah. Right. Instead of saying, okay, this is where I am. That's where I want to be. How long should it realistically take me to get there? Instead, people are like, okay, you know what? I'm going to run a marathon because I've decided that I want to start running this year or I need to get back into my running. Yep. And so I need a race on the calendar to stay consistent, to make sure that I stay motivated. So, all right, let's see, it's January. So I should probably do one earlier in the year, especially because I live in Florida and the weather's it nicer. Really it gets really hot in the summertime. Yeah. So even though I probably should take about six months to train, no. I can probably do it in two because there's a February race that I hear yes. is really nice and it runs along the beach. And a lot of my friends are doing that. Yep. And I could probably we build up that. So I'm going to go ahead and register it. And then they go back and they're like, okay, now I'm going to find a half marathon training plan. Let's go to coach Google. Let's go to coach Garmin. Okay, good. A 12 week plan. Ooh, huh. It's only, I only have 10 weeks. Because we'll just chop the first two so off. We're, gonna chop, we're gonna start at week three. Or we start start at week one and just decide you're not gonna do the last two weeks. Either, okay, so you're either missing way. your long distance run at the end of it. Right. So <laughs> either way. This strict timeline, when you have that race and you're like, this has to be the race that I'm going to run, and there's not a long enough timeline here, that can cause so many problems. That can cause injury. That can cause, again, frustration over results. It can cause you to start training and then just get so burnt out by it because you're not you don't have the proper foundation. You're not giving yourself a, a good enough timeline. There's so many different things. And like Kevin said, that failure to adjust along the way, that failure to take real life into consideration and not acknowledging the starting point and everything else that's going into it. Right. Which leads to kind of the big picture on a personalized plan is it needs to be designed with your goals and priorities, mm -hmm. both in running and in your life. Yep. 
if you just pick out a plan and you're like, oh, this plan is going to be perfect for me to hit my running goal and it completely ignores any other life goals that you have, it's not a good plan. If you have a plan that's like, this is how I'm going to be super successful in my life and it ignores running, that's great plan for life. But how are you going to get to your running goal? You need something that actually incorporates both of them, that you have clear goals and priorities of what goes over one thing. You pointed out in the last thing, the runner who has a plan and then, you know, a sickness comes up or the the kid gets sick. Mm -hmm. Where's the priority? Do you have to get your run in or are you going to stay home and take care of the sick kid? Establishing your priorities mm -hmm. early is super important because then when adjustments need to get made, you make the adjustments logically mm -hmm. based off of the priorities that you have already very clearly established. Yeah. I, you know, this was a conversation that I had with one of my one-on-one -on -one clients recently because her training, like her daughter came home for the holidays mm -hmm. and it was a priority for her to spend time with her daughter. So Great. she didn't get some of her training in and that was a decision she made. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. You knew your priorities. Now don't beat yourself up for it, right? Like if you decided I am going to spend more time with my daughter and I'm not going to train, okay, you're allowed to make whatever choice you want in your life. Just understand, okay, this is the choice I'm making. I don't need to feel guilty about it. I don't need to beat myself up about it. And if my race doesn't go the way that I want it to, I'm going to know why. Yep. Right. Like I'm going to understand, well, you know, I, I missed two weeks of training here or my training was really spotty for a couple of weeks here. I got in two out of the five days per week that I was supposed to be training. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just accept it. Understand that's what you chose and that's fine because it's your life. You can choose whatever mm -hmm. you want, right? Like there is no judgment here as, as your coach, it's my job to just help you understand the results of your actions or your inactions, right? Yeah. And what's leading to those actions or inactions? That's your thoughts, okay? So what do you want to think about? What do you want to, to believe? What do you want to prioritize in your life? What is important to you? Because whatever's important to you is going to drive your actions and then your actions are going to give you the results that you have. And so once you just understand that pattern, once you understand that flow of how things work, then you can make whatever choice you want. Right. And then as long as your actions are in fact following your priorities and you're not trying to like always combat against, like, I feel like I should be doing this, but I'm actually going to do that. When you have alignment with your priorities, mm -hmm. then the whole life just gets filled with more joy. Yeah. Maybe you get faster. Maybe you get in more time with your family, but whatever it is, you've set your priorities. And if you're living according to those priorities, you're going to be happier. Mm -hmm. whatever, you know, you could be as fast as you want to be. Maybe your neighbor is knocking off PRs every other week, but you're not, but you're like, but look at all this time I'm spending with my two-year-old mm -hmm. that I'm never going to get again. Yes. Like that's a different priority and you should be able to enjoy that. And maybe someone else says, okay, but I, I can spend plenty of time with them, but I really, at my age, this is as fast as I'm ever going to be. I want to make sure I spend time running and getting as fast as I can be. That's great also. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you just figure out what your priority is and then aim towards that. That's where the joy is. Yeah, there's no right or wrong, mm -hmm. right? They're just choices and you get to make them What for whatever works best for you in your life. And you're the one that gets to decide that, right? So I think that that's really, really important for us to understand. So once you understand those priorities, then you need to take a look at what your goal is and then set a proper timeline. You want to set a reasonable timeline based on the size of the goal. Mm -hmm. So if you have a really big goal that you've never accomplished before, so say the longest you've ever run is a 5k and you decide I want to run a half marathon this year. Okay. That's great. Do you want to do it in February or do you want to do it in December? Or are you okay with that timeline also being flexible based on how your body responds to training, mm -hmm. right? Because I think this is the thing that a lot of people aren't willing to do. They want to set these strict timelines because when you listen to 
training podcasts and when you listen to personal development and goal setting and those kinds of things, a lot of people tell you to set quote unquote smart goals. They want you to be specific, measurable. A is accountable, not accountable, actionable, achievable. No. Achievable. Is it achievable? Achievable. R mm -hmm. is. Well, so I, I like to say relevant. Results driven. Some people, so, so people actually change the, the SMART I, acronym. I've, I've heard so many talks on SMART and yeah. that's why I can't remember them all because they're all different. They're all different. They're all related. They're all similar, right? <laughs> like the, they're all, it's, it's specific, measurable, like action, actionable, I think is one of, one of them relevant or results driven or realistic. That's yep. another one that I've seen. Yep. And the T is time-based time oriented something to I that think that's effect. what you're trying to get to was the T is it time was, oriented right it was the T so they tell you you got you have to set a timeline for your goals and that's fine but timelines need to you, you, need, you need to understand that timelines can change. Timelines can be flexible, again, based on the size of your goal, based on how far away or close to that goal you are, based on if that is an outcome goal or a process goal. Are we looking at the actual result that you want to achieve? Is that the goal? Or are we looking at the actions that you're going to commit to in order to get you to that goal? Because there are different ways to set goals that are more effective for you to actually get to the place where you want to go. Right. I mean, if you're setting process-oriented goals, those are very specific. And the, the time is, is you know, every day, every other day. It's every whatever week. it's whatever that process is that you've created. Right. It's it's going to be very quickly noticing whether you've hit the goal or not. And that's when SMART goals are very helpful. Sure. But if you have a massive goal, you want to run a marathon and you've literally never run before, you want a blurry timeline on that. Like, it'd be great if I could do it within the next 12 months. But if it doesn't work out, maybe it's going to take me another six months or 12 months beyond that. Right. It's got a blurry timeline, but you know it's going to be a little while. You don't want it like, I'd like to run a marathon eventually. You want a timeline out there so that you do start trying to make progress. So that you start taking actions. So that you start taking actions. But that timeline should be a little bit blurry blurry out there. You know, I've got, I've got huge goals out there, but one of my goals involves getting into a race that has a lottery. So there's a blurriness right. to that timeline because I don't have control over the results of that mm -hmm. lottery. If I did, we would have hit the mega millions last night, but I don't have control over lotteries. So, you know, depending on what that goal is, you want either more specific and then a very specific plan if it's kind of a short-term goal or a very process-oriented goal. But if it's a really big goal, it's going to take you a while, realize that that timeline might need to stretch a little bit. Maybe things are going super smooth and that timeline can compress a little bit, but it needs to be an adjustable timeline. Right. So make sure you set the goal, make sure you set a reasonable timeline, but be willing to adjust it. And then you have to find and set up a plan that's going to work for you. So how do you personalize a plan? Number one, you have to decide how many days per week you are willing and able to work out. Mm -hmm. Like to me, that's that's number one. That's like, a really good starting right? point that a lot of people skip. Well, actually, let's go back one step. The question that you need to ask yourself is, do I want to adjust my life to fit my running or do I want to adjust my running to fit my life? Now, it's kind of a very specific question, right? that priority. You mentioned it, but that's a really good question to ask yourself. Right. Of so set the priorities. Right. So again, do I want to adjust my running to fit my life or do I want to adjust my life to fit my running? An example of this would be training for a marathon. If you know that training for a marathon is your goal, are you willing to adjust the rest of your life to fit into one of these marathon plans? Mm -hmm. A lot of marathon plans have people running five or six days a week. If you're not currently doing that, are you willing to add those training days? Are you willing to try to fit that into your schedule? Are you willing to also fit in extra recovery time? Are you willing to say no to happy hours or social events so that you can get enough rest and recovery and have enough time to train? Are you willing to put in the extra strength work to get you to that point, right? Mm -hmm. that, is, that is what I mean when I'm saying adjust your life to fit your goal. 
right? There is a whole lot of like social events that yeah. might not really work with you mm -hmm. if you're really aiming for something super huge that not just like, I'd like to complete a marathon, but if you're really shooting for like the best you could possibly do in a marathon. A BQ, right? That's a big goal for a lot of a people. big goal for a lot right? of people. Right? Like when I say a BQ, so some of you, I know we've gotten questions like before, like on Instagram, what are you guys talking about with BQ? BQ means Boston qualifier, which means like for, to, in order to get into the Boston marathon, you have to apply and you have to have a qualifying time that you've already run in another race, or you can get in via charity, right? So there are mul multiple ways to get into the Boston marathon, but a lot of runners want to run a BQ, a Boston qualifying time in another marathon so that they can qualify for Boston, because that is a badge of honor that a lot of runners like to wear, like to want to achieve. We have a lot of UK listeners. It's like best of age to get into the London Best marathon. of age for London. Yeah. But there's best of age, and you also have to be from the UK, yeah. which means it doesn't matter how fast I run. I, I can't right. I can't fast myself into that race. Yeah. So are you willing to adjust the rest of your life to fit that goal? Or are you do you would you rather adjust your running to fit into the rest of your life? Like, okay, right now my life is really busy. I've got three kids, they've got sports practices, I've got a full-time job, I've got X, Y, and Z. I know that I can only train four days a week. Mm -hmm. I know that I can only train maybe five days a week. Then you have to ask yourself, is now the best time for me to train for a marathon, right? If I can't follow the plan that I, that I need to follow to best prepare me for that race, is that the best goal for me? Am I willing to adjust my running in, to fit into my life? Or do I need to adjust like do i need to adjust my running goal so that i can better fit the training into my lifestyle right right you said have a pretty stressful life there yeah. that doesn't mean that you can't run a marathon it just means right. that you might not be able to chase the fastest marathon that you're capable of right or it also means that you need a, a plan again that's going to be personalized for you so that okay I know that this is really important to me and I do want to do this right now but I know I only have four days a week, five mm -hmm. days a week to train, right? I know that I am willing to give up social events. Like I'm not sure. willing to, to compromise some of the stuff with my kids, but I'm willing to give up on some of this other things. But I still, these are the days that I have to work with. Okay, how can you create a plan within those time frames and time limits that is going to prepare you the best? Will it be the most ideal plan for any runner ever to run a marathon? You can't say that, right? Because again, that's going back to our whole generic plan idea. But will that be the best plan for you, for your body, in your life right now with the lifestyle that you want to maintain in order to get you the best results possible for the goal that you want to achieve? Right. And I mean, it, it, there's so many things that go into that because then you have to go into your own running history right. and your own history of injury. And you're like, okay, well, if I'm only going four days a week, do I do, I do speed a lot? Do you have a large history of speed? Because some people do. Some like, are you? Do you have a history of injury? Because then maybe you're going to do a whole lot of low intensity stuff. Focus on a little bit of strength to make sure that you avoid injury as best as possible. Right. Like, there are so many different ways to do this. Are, are you a swimmer? Right. Sure. Maybe like, you, you want have to, massive cardio. Yeah. Like, do you want to incorporate swimming and cross training? Mm -hmm. Right. Like, can you add that in? Like, there's so many other ways. Do you love swimming? right? Do you want to incorporate? I really want to train for a marathon, but I don't want to give up my swimming, Yeah, right? Like there's a lot of other things. How can you personalize that plan to make it work best for you and also make you enjoy the heck out of it? Yes. Right. Ultimately joy yeah. is kind of the, like, the goal here. If you go, if you find a running coach that's like, oh no, you have to run five days a week. And you, like, so if that means you have to skip swimming, you have to skip swimming for during this training cycle, but you love swimming, find a coach or find a training plan that helps you incorporate swimming mm -hmm. into your plan because yep. that is a source of joy for you. Maybe you love running with your running group and you know that they all run slower than you do, but you really love running with them. Figure out a way to make that work. Maybe you do some runs solo so that you can hit some of those higher speeds that maybe they can't hit, but then you do your longer, slower runs with them or vice versa. Maybe they're too fast for you. Yep, that happens a lot. Right? Maybe you love running with your friends, but they're really faster than you. And you notice that when you run with them, you're pushing yourself to more of like an L5, L6 effort level when you should be down at an L2. Okay, then do your speed workouts with them. 
and keep your slow, easy days by yourself or find friends that are more around that pace that you want to keep for your L2 runs. Yeah, 100%. Like, yeah. You've got to make sure that, that it works for you so that you have the most fun with the plan. Yeah. If you find a coach who says, look, it doesn't matter if it's fun or not, this is the plan that's going to get you the results, you have not actually found a coach. Like, I don't think you found a coach, period. You just found some jerk who has a lot of confidence in themselves. Like <laughs> as though they in fact did make a magic generic plan. They There's don't, no such thing. They don't have a magic plan. No. That plan is not going to work for you. No. Even if it, it somehow was designed perfectly for you, if you look at the plan, you're like, that looks awful, then you're not going to enjoy the process mm -hmm. and that, therefore you're not going to get the best results out of it. Yeah. Like part of you has to actually enjoy the experience along the way mm -hmm. in order to reap all of the benefits. Yeah. You know, and we've had so many clients in the academy that have had these types of issues. Like I want to train for this race. Okay, great. Here's the plan. Well, but on Sundays, I always go out for like a three hour hike with my husband and yeah. I really love that. <laughs> okay, how can we incorporate that, right? Like, Let's figure this out. And that's how Kevin and I like to look at coaching. It's like, here are the constraints that we're working with. How can we create the best plan for that person Help to help them to be the most successful, right? It might not be the quote unquote ideal plan that we would have created, but it is the ideal plan for them. And that's what matters. That's, that's what it's all about. It's learning how to personalize a plan and how to adjust a plan in a way that works for you. And that's really what we love helping runners do. That's what we teach inside of our academy. And so if that's something that you are interested in, in learning more about, we have that program for you, okay? And I would love to show you our ways. We basically teach you exactly how to do it yourself so that you can make these personalized plans and adjustments for yourself for the rest of your life, for every training plan that you decide to undertake. Mm -hmm. So if you are interested in the Academy, I would love to, to invite you to come over to our website, realliferunners.com forward slash Academy. That will take you to the waiting list page. And I'm doing these coaching information sessions on a weekly basis now where I just like to meet with people on Zoom. I would love to invite you to, to come join me on a Zoom call so I can just kind of learn more about you, learn more about your life and the things that you're dealing with and how you can help you figure out how to adjust and personalize those plans that are right for you. So if you want a, information on our next coaching information session, just sign up over there for the wait list over at realliferunners.com forward slash academy. Get your email on that wait list and you'll be emailed when the next coaching information session is happening. And if you don't like email and you like to hang out on Instagram, instead, just send me a DM over on Instagram at Real Life Runners. Send me a message over there and I can give you the information that way as well. Okay. But I, I'm really enjoying these coaching information yeah, information great. sessions that, that we've been running because I love getting to know you guys. I love hearing about the things that you're struggling with and fig and I can help you figure out how to overcome those things. So come hit me up. That sounds like a great plan. Yeah. So we hope this was help for, helpful for you guys. We know that this is something that so many runners struggle with and trying to figure out how to really customize these plans to work for you so that you can find more joy in your running is a total game changer so that you can stop beating yourselves up and feeling guilty because you're not following plans or you're missing days. When you have that plan that you know is the right thing for you, it makes such a huge difference in your experience of running. So we would love to teach you our ways. That's when you really have the faith in the plan mm -hmm. and you can follow follow it and adjust it right. and still have faith in the plan. Exactly. The ability to adjust and maintain faith in the plan, that's that's a fantastic combination. Absolutely huge. Absolutely huge. All right, you guys. So that's what we've got for you today. So as always, thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget to follow us over on Instagram at Real Life Runners and send me a DM to say hi and let me know what your favorite takeaway from this episode was. So as always, we appreciate you guys being here. This has been the Real Life Runners podcast, episode number 289. Now get out there and run your life.